Good afternoon and welcome to the State Museum's Facebook Live. I'm James, I'm one of the educators here at the museum. And today we're going to be talking about New Yorkers in the First World War. Now I got to apologize right away. I am in the uniform of a soldier in the American Army during World War I, but my glasses are not regulation. I got to wear them so I can see while we're talking. So let's get going. Right now, we no longer have the exhibit in the museum, but if you are interested, please go to our website. You can find the exhibit online, and there's much more there that you can view and explore after this program. So, New York in the First World War. It's unique what happened with New York. New York was called the Empire State for a reason. We were a powerhouse as far as the economics and the population for the United States. New York contributed more New Yorkers to support the war effort than any other state. And that's why we're gonna talk about the people from New York who were involved in the war and what they were going through. So we're gonna start off by talking about some of the New Yorkers you can find out about from our website. We have a number of individuals that are really fascinating. This is Lieutenant James Reese Europe, and he is most well known for establishing the Harlem Hellfighters Band, and he is accredited with introducing jazz music to Europe, which is really, really fascinating. And he wrote a number of songs, uh, and other items that are really interesting and really talk about his experience during the First World War. Um, so Lieutenant Reese traveled in France with his band and he played for the public and for the militaries. And that's how he really spread jazz music and acted as an ambassador of goodwill. Uh, other individuals that I can point out and include this gentleman right here. He was uh, one of the most decorated New Yorkers that served during the First World War. And you can find more information about him on our website. And he is Sergeant O'Neill. Another individual that we have is Esther. Um, she served as a nurse during the First World War, and we have a nurse's uniform that she wore, and we'll be going into that and talking a little bit about nurses later on. So what was it like to be a soldier from New York in the First World War? Well, let's first look at the clothing, the uniform, and the equipment, and we're just going to talk about it in some generalities here. So for soldiers, they would be issued a uniform that looks just like this. Um, I gotta tell you right now, I am sweating a little bit and that's because of the materials it's made out of. This is wool and it's nice and really thick and heavy. And I gotta say, it's really itchy as well. And it really, keeps you warm, which is really important when it's cold out. And another nice thing about the wool uniform is it helps wick sweat and water away from the body. The only really big downside is it's really thick, a little heavy, and it's really, really warm. And there's a major problem with it too. And it's not a problem with the uniform itself. It's the fact that you only got issued one set of this uniform. And bathing facilities weren't readily available or laundering services for that matter. And soldiers often had what they called cooties. So these are little animals that would crawl in and they would start to live in the seams of the uniforms. And they're really lice. 
And they would bite the soldiers and live in the uniforms and make this uniform even more uncomfortable. Now, this uniform is a little tricky to put on. So the outer coat is not too hard. It's just a standard set of buttons. Uh, it does fasten at the collar with a couple of little clips. Uh, but underneath this, you have a shirt. And below that, you have your breeches. So these are not actually full-length trousers. They start at the waist. And I'm really tall. So on me, they come down to about here. So they're not pants that go down all the way. And you often would find soldiers uh, emulating the British and French armies, and the American army began doing this, and you would wear putties. So it's a, it's a wool wrap, it's about six feet long, and you would start off the bottom, wrap it around, and then continue wrapping it up your leg. Now, I'm not an expert at it, but I'm pretty decent. I can get my putties on in about five minutes and make sure they're nice and tight and wrapped well. And they're actually there for a practical reason, even though they're not so practical to put on. They keep your leg nice and warm. They protect your leg, keeps your material nice and tight so that you don't catch your leg or the clothing you're wearing on any obstacles like barbed wire. And it keeps the mud from getting into your boots. And that's really important because the soldiers who are living and fighting in the trenches in the First World War are dealing with a lot of water and mud. So generally speaking, soldiers did a rotation. They would start uh, in the rear and then they would be rotated to the support trench and then they would eventually be rotated to the first line trench where the active fighting happened. And they would stay there for a period of time and then they would be rotated back to the rear. Now, the front line trench, it's not just the fighting you have to be worried about, it's all the other things you have to be worried about as well. So, some trenches are very nice. And you can see this picture from the period and the American soldiers there. Uh, the walls have materials to keep the walls from caving in. And this trench has duck boards. So the soldiers are able to keep their feet out of the mud, but you can even see the mud right there in that soldier's boots and his putties. But some of these trenches aren't this nice and they would have a nice thick layer of mud at the bottom that you would be standing in uh, to perform duty. And that is not a pleasant experience. And I can speak from firsthand experience. When you have wet feet and they're wet for a really long period of time, it's really uncomfortable and it's actually very unhealthy. So keeping your feet out of the mud and dry is really important and keeping the mud out of your boots is one way to help with that. Um, other things you would have to deal with in a trench besides all the cooties, the lice, uh, you also had furry little friends with four legs and a long hairless tail that would run along the trench as well. And I'm talking about rats here. Uh, the First World War trenches were really known for having rats and that would end up with some uh, activities like trying to catch rats or keep them away from you while you were working or sleeping. Um, not so much fun. Uh, another thing about the uniform that we didn't really talk about is the boots. So the boots are nice leather boots, but the sole is leather, which is not really good. So one of the things the American army did was they put hobnails on the bottom of the boot and if you play sports, I bet you can guess what these hobnails are used for. They're there to provide traction so you don't slip, and it helps protect the leather sole of the shoe. 
Now I gotta be honest, while wearing this uniform, I can feel the hobbed nails through the sole of the boot when I stand on really hard surfaces. So it's not the most pleasant experience in the world. Now, in addition to the uniform, you would also have other items. Uh, overseas cap is very common. You'll see in photographs of the period. Soldiers would be wearing these. But more iconic is actually the helmet. So if you look in the picture, you can often see soldiers wearing this helmet. You can see there is a liner and a chin strap. And it's actually not super uncomfortable. It does protect the top of the head. And that's a really important thing. In the First World War, when you're in the trenches, you're more worried about things that are coming down, like shrapnel from artillery. But I got to tell you, when I'm wearing this, it does come off kind of easy if you're not careful. So that would be one really big downside to you wearing a helmet. It does pop off occasionally. So you'd have to make sure it was on nice and tight and fitted and snug. That's the basics of the uniform. Now there's a lot more gear that would go into this as well. One of the most important pieces of gear is actually this right here, my mystery bag. So if you look in photos, you can often see soldiers that are in the trenches wearing this around their neck. And this is actually one of the more important pieces of equipment that a soldier would have during the First World War. And this is a gas mask, carrier with the gas mask inside. So the gas mask, worn around the chest, or uh, on the chest, it could be flipped open and you could pull the gas mask out really quickly when you heard a certain sound. So if you're sensitive to noise, uh, you might want to cover your ears for just a second. So one of the ways you knew to put your gas mask on is if you heard one of these. So this is a chemical alarm for poison gas. And I'm going to spin it right now. So that's really important that it's really loud. So when soldiers heard that really loud noise, they knew it was time to put this gas mask on. Now, I gotta say, it does take a little bit to get it on. It's a nice cloth covering. There is a bite valve, so if you've ever gone snorkeling, it's very much the same bite valve that you'll have on snorkels. And there's a nose clip you have to put over your nose. So I'm going to put it on really quick. Kind of. Mm -hmm. And then, you hear the helmet right there. Now, the helmet can't hear you today, and that's how you do it with your shoulders. One of the drawbacks of wearing a mask like this is that you can't communicate that well. You probably couldn't hear me talk. That's because when I spoke into it, I couldn't enunciate too well because I'm biting on the bite valve. If you let go of the bite valve, the mask doesn't work as well. And then everything has to go through this tube and through the filter here. So when I'm breathing, you can actually feel the air coming out of the filter. And if I put my hand over it, I can't breathe. I don't want to do that. That's not too good. Um, so this is the whole system. When you're wearing the mask, your filter would stay in the bag. Now, this is not only a really important piece of equipment, but there's something really important that is needed to make it work. So that filter that you saw would oftentimes be filled with a 
chemical made from fruit pits. So this is one way all New Yorkers could get involved in the war effort. Uh, people at home were encouraged to save the pit, and then they would turn the pits in to be used to make the chemical that went into the gas mask filters. So it's not just soldiers and nurses going overseas, it's everyone that is involved in the community getting involved and contributing in whatever way they can. So you would have uh, children and other individuals who are living at home doing their part to support the war effort. Uh, other pieces of equipment that might seem a little bit more mundane and everyday would include the pack carrier and your ammunition belt. And, and this is a very standard piece of equipment that a soldier in World War from New York would carry. Now, I apologize right now. I don't have all of the pieces that would go into it, but I have enough to represent what it is. So your ammunition up for as a soldier would go into the ammunition belt. You would have a first aid pouch, a canteen with a cup, and then your pouch would carry all of the belongings that you would bring with you. And this is one whole piece. So as you're fighting or living in the trenches, this would go with you everywhere. So in this kit, the main body, you would have this pouch on the far outside. And this is where you would store eating utensils, uh, your mess kit, things of that nature. Underneath, we have the entrenching shovel, which is nice and short, because as you're wearing this, you don't want it dangling too far down your body. And then on the inside, it has all of your personal belongings. So I'm just gonna put it on really quick to show you what it looks like before I tear it all apart. Now, a soldier's combat load would actually be pretty heavy because they are carrying ammunition, water, other weapons. And as you can see, it is not the easiest thing in the world to put on, nor is it the most comfortable thing in the world. So once you get it on, you want to wear it nice and tight. And speaking right now, this is not fully loaded with all the ammunition, the water, and all the things that would be in the pack. And it's still fairly heavy. So a soldier's combat load, what they had to carry while fighting, is not light. So these soldiers had to be trained and they had to be physically fit in order to do their jobs. So let's look inside and see a few of the things soldiers carried with them. Give me a second here. So inside of this pack, you would typically find a shelter half, which is half of a tent. Now, now that might sound a little funny, but you would actually clip your shelter half to somebody else's shelter half to make a whole tent. Uh, you would have your overcoat, for cold, cold weather, and you would have a nice, again, wool blanket. So it's a nice wool blanket that would keep you warm. Again, it's a little itchy, but you learn to live with it. So inside you would find a variety of things. So uh, hygiene is always important to do the best you can. So you would often find a hygiene kit, so shaving equipment, uh, shaving is very important for wearing the gas mask. You gotta have a clean face so the gas doesn't get under the gas mask, so it seals properly around the face. Uh, dental care is always important, so uh, making sure your teeth are clean. You would have your cootie finder, so we combing the hair, also using devices to try to find lice in your uniform is very important as well. Uh, keeping your feet nice and dry. So not only do you have 
extra pairs of socks. Now this is not a GI regulation sock, but it does represent how people could get involved from home. So people at home are often knitting extra socks and scarves and wristlets to make sure that soldiers overseas had extra things to keep them warm and to try to help them with their comfort and their hygiene. So extra socks are very important, as is foot powder. And in case you're wondering just what a wristlet is, a wristlet is essentially a fingerless glove. You would slide it over your wrist and hand. There's one hole on the top for your thumb, and then there's a hole on the end for your fingers. And if you needed to, you could just slide it down to expose more of your hand. And then when you didn't need your hands and they got cold, you could just slide it back down to cover your fingers. And you can even tuck your fingers in to keep them a little warmer. And when you're on your own and you have one uniform, being able to do repairs is very important. So you would often find soldiers with sewing kits. So you'd have uh, needles, thread, and other implements that you could use to mend your uniform. Now, it's not just those items that would be carried in here or seen in the trenches. There is a lot more and a lot more to explore, but we're not going to cover those items right now. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get kind of hungry. Anytime I talk about food, I get kind of hungry. So we could talk about food in the First World War as well. Now, soldiers in the United States Army during the First World War were the best fed soldiers that fought in the First World War. And the army tried to make sure that they got fresh, hot meals whenever possible. So you would find that the American soldiers were getting milk when they could get it up to the soldiers, fresh bread, hot soups and stews and things of that nature. But that isn't always possible, whether it's due to fighting or, more importantly, to poison gas. So the army created a reserve ration, an emergency ration. So those food items would be sent to the trenches and they're encased in tin. So you would have bread in a bread can and you'd get two of these a day. And then you would get a nice can of meat. So one pound of meat. And then you would receive a emergency ration of coffee, sugar, salt, and tobacco. And there's a really important reason why these food items are canned. Obviously you wanna make sure it doesn't spoil by being exposed to air and temperature. You don't want rats and other animals to get in and spoil the food by eating it. But you don't want poison gas to contaminate the food. So being able to seal the can, keep the food safe from the poison gas, was very important during the First World War. Now, it's not all fighting in the trenches, in the frontline trenches, or even in the support trench. There's other things that are happening as well. So daily, a soldier would get up before dawn and they would stand too and wait just in case the enemy was preparing attack. About a half hour after dawn, they would go about doing breakfast and personal hygiene uh, and doing some basic uh, maintenance to their equipment or uniforms. They would eat lunch, which that was sometimes called dinner, uh, depending on where you were. And then in the afternoon was a time for you to rest, sleep, and perform some other tasks that needed to be done during the day. And then you would eat your actual dinner later on in the evening. And then right about the time the sun was going down, you would stand to again, just in case the enemy decided to attack right as the sun's going down and setting then your day probably got pretty busy because at night, that's when soldiers weren't 
out of the trenches into no man's land, as the name suggests. It's not someplace you wanted to be. And they would do repairs to wire, fix the trenches from the outside, uh, and then try to find ways to breach their enemies' wire and trenches, and maybe doing a night raid and things of that nature. So it's a very unorthodox day as far as what we're usually used to. But again, it's not all fighting. Uh, people are doing things to try to relax or pass the time. Reading, writing letters, playing games, those are all important things. And soldiers begin to start taking up a really cool activity. Uh, soldiers began to take what was around them and turn them into art. Uh, so shell casings from artillery were in uh, some of the items that were turned into art, uh, taking your equipment like your canteen and carving on it, and then finding other things. This particular piece from our collection is from the Hindenburg line, and it was taken by a soldier that served in a 27th division, and that soldier created a very unique piece of art that uh, incorporates elements of what that soldier was proud of. So you can see that there's the US Eagle on there with the red, white, and blue. You can see that it includes the soldier's unit insignia for the 27th Division. And it also includes in a few other artistic elements to it. And this particular soldier decided to mark Hindenburg line to represent the time that they spent fighting around the Hindenburg line. And then eventually the 27th Division helped breach this immense fortification. Uh, it was truly impressive. Now, it's not just men who are overseas supporting the war effort. Uh, women also were actively involved. Uh, some women joined to work as nurses in hospitals. So Esther, the photograph you saw earlier, this is her nurse's uniform. Now these uniforms had to be created. And when they were created for women to support the war effort, they were actually modeled on soldiers' uniforms. So if you look at Esther's uniform coat, it looks similar to the uniform coat I'm wearing. The same goes with the headgear. Esther's headgear, her hat, is based on the Army's overseas cap. So these are all important elements that the military is taking into account as they're creating these uh, uniforms and making the uniforms, well, uniform, making them similar. And women often were right up towards the front. A number of nurses actually died during the war uh, due to illnesses. Um, some of the hospitals actually came under shell fire. Uh, nurses even had to have gas masks just in case the hospital or the area they were in was gassed. So they were not immune from the difficulties of war either. And many of these nurses served with great distinction doing the jobs that needed to be done. Uh, also, women and civilians uh, helped by providing relief to soldiers. So the YMCA, and the American Red Cross provided uh, programs and materials for soldiers to try to alleviate their day, provide simple comforts, uh, whether it was books or comfort foods or even a hot cup of coffee and a hot donut. So they were doing their part to help the war effort as well. Now, 
I've just briefly talked about a few things, uh, the equipment, food, uniforms, and a couple of people. I highly encourage everyone to visit the New York State Museum's exhibit online and check out this wonderful history that has been done. There's a lot of propaganda posters, uh, photographs, information about people, many more people than what I talked about. Uh, and you can see a, a good history from New York State's involvement in the First World War. Are there There's any questions? Question. Okay. Did the word cooties come from World War I? Uh, I can't say definitely yes, but it definitely came into the popular lingo during the First World War. Uh, and what's fascinating is to see how it's spread culturally. Uh, you have games that come out for children about cooties. Uh, it's, I remember growing up as a kid and we'd heard things like the circle, circle, dot, dot. Now you have your cootie shot. So it's not something that was just a quick fad and then disappeared. Um, but it definitely came into the popular culture, pop, the norm during the First World War. It? Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Please visit the online exhibit, A Spirit of Sacrifice in the First World War. And if you have any questions, please reach out to the staff at the New York State Museum.